Welcome. It's my great pleasure today to have a conversation with Dr. Ray Gist. And he is one of our most prominent alumni. Dr. Gist graduated from dental school here at the University of Michigan in 1966. He lives in Grand Blanc, Michigan and practices dentistry in Flint. He has had a huge number of leadership roles and that's what we're gonna talk a bit about today. Um, he served as the president of the Michigan Dental Association, the American Dental Association. Um, he has achieved fellowship in the International College, the American College, the Pierre Fouchard Academy. Uh, he's an active member in the NDA, the Academy of General Dentistry, and he's received a lot of awards as well. So, First, let me just thank you, Ray. Is it okay if I call you Ray? Oh, certainly. Okay, <laughs> thank you for being with me today. Um, let's just start and ask you, how was it that you decided to go to dental school? Well, it's a long story, really, Lori. It, you can call it determination <laughs> because um, I wanted to prove to not only myself, but to my family and my friends that uh, I could graduate from dental school. I really became familiar with uh, dentistry and medicine through some practitioners that, that I had met and I really liked their lifestyle. My family was a family of eight. I had uh, three brothers and four sisters and lived on a farm in Arkansas until my family decided to move to Michigan. And I was about three and a half years old. But the neighborhood that we moved into was really distressed. Um, it, was, it was just um, not satisfactory to me. And I did not want to live that way after I matured, after I um, graduated from high school and decided what I wanted to do. And that was in Flint? They moved yes. from Arkansas to Flint? It was, yes. I went to Flint Northern High School. Okay. But when I told my parents that um, I was interested in going to college, nobody in my family had ever even talked about college. So they kind of laughed it off and thought it was a childhood dream. And I told them that really I wanted to go no matter what. And but we were struggling financially. So really, uh, nobody said very much about it. But I did make plans. I was about 13 years old when I decided uh, my strategy to go. I chose dentistry because I thought that I would have an easier time, number one, in a dental practice, and number two, getting a dental degree. I thought it would take less time and um, I would be able to start you know, a lot sooner with a practice like dentistry than I would with medicine. So not having enough, I did apply to undergraduate school at uh, University of Michigan when I graduated from high school, but, and I was accepted, but it was more expensive than I or anybody in the family could handle. So I ended up going to Flint Junior College, um, community college in the area. I had done my research and I went for year round for two years to, to uh, get enough credits in order to qualify for dental school. And sure enough, I took my DAT down in Ann Arbor and passed it well because I got a letter of acceptance from the University of Michigan School of Dentistry. And after I did my cartwheels and let everybody know, then, <laughs> then I teased them and said, I told you so. So that, that was um, really so gratifying for me that um, I just couldn't wait to get on the road to Ann Arbor and get busy. That's awesome. Yeah, that's that's how I got started. I love it. And then after you graduated from dental school, you went into the Air Force. Yes. And I'm curious how you decided to enlist in the Air Force and what your Air Force experience did for your professional life. It was 1962 when I went to um, when I when I, I went to dental school. I'm, I'm just thinking here. Yeah. Uh, that was my freshman year. And I enlisted in my freshman year for several reasons. Number one, 
the, the Vietnam conflict was going on and I was eligible for the draft and I did not want to graduate and find a, a practice or associateship or uh, employment elsewhere in dentistry and then get drafted and have to leave. Mm. So I talked to an officer and um, he recruited me because he said going in as a captain would give me privileges which would be better pay and better privileges. And also um, when I separated from the Air Force that the four years that I spent in dental school would count off my reserves that I would have had had I uh, been drafted. So all those things considered, I decided, yes, I'm, I'm going to enlist. So mm -hmm. I did it in my freshman year. And when I, when I uh, graduated, when I got my degree, I did uh, really a minimum amount of, of basic training in Texas. And I uh, was signed to the Philippine Islands, just um, one last flight stop away from, from Vietnam. Uh, there was Clark Air Base in the, in the Philippine Islands. And it was a good experience. Um, I learned a lot. But, and you um, practiced dentistry there. On yes, the, yes, on the troops. Uh -huh. I did. I was treating um, soldiers as they would have that stop on their way to Vietnam. And also when, when they returned. So I got to treat a lot of um, very interesting cases. Wow, it was, <laughs> they were in bad shape. Uh, also forensics, pilots that had been flying sorties and crashed and burned. Oh. Um, we had to identify them so that the remains could be sent to their families. So all of this as a new graduate was uh, <laughs> wow. uh, interesting, if, <laughs> if nothing else. But so how long but, were you in the Philippines? Then? Uh, two years, okay. active duty. And then I actually could separate. So I left the service then. Uh, they did ask if I, would, if I wanted to stay. And um, they said I could stay for 20 years <laughs> and, and get retirement pay. But um, I told them two years was enough. That's, that's fine. And let me go. My family came over after I was there for a year. So Jill and my newborn daughter had uh, spent one year with, with me while I was there. And oh, wow. So you went by yourself initially? Yes. Okay. Yes. That must have been tough. It was. It was. It was. Wow. What an experience. Um, there are a lot of different things in, in those islands. Although when they got there, we did live through an earthquake. And um, it, the weather was really variable. Uh, one hurricane, one earthquake. And but it, some of the um, growth and some of the bugs, I got used to it, but it nearly scared Jill back, back to the airport to go home. <laughs> and so when you, when you left the Air Force, you came right to setting up a practice and- No, I went, I was, I was employed by my, my Children's Health Center. Okay. And I was at my, about a year and a half and in, interestingly, that's when I was introduced to organized dentistry. I went to some meetings of uh, Genesee District Dental Society, and I, I met some, well, some future associates, really, and I learned a lot, actually, with, within those first couple of meetings, and decided to go ahead and join. So I joined uh, the tripartite, and I got involved in committee work. Um, did very well with committees. And some of it was intriguing, especially with legislative um, activities. And it kind of taught me that I did have some influence that um, when I would talk or I would write my opinion and get it, get it uh, published, that there were a lot of people that were listening. Mm -hmm. So I did really, I moved up that ladder after I got invitation after invitation. You know, why don't you come and, and try this out? You know, why don't you run for um, president of the local dental society? Which I did, and, and I won that one. So another election came up for the Michigan Dental Association. 
And I won that one. So I moved to the Board of Trustees. I had another election that came up for a secretary of the Michigan Dental Association. And I won that one and spent three years as secretary of MDA. And gosh, I think those three years taught me more about what's going on in organized dentistry mm -hmm. than anything else. And so I, I carried a lot of, of knowledge for those years. I was on that board for six years and I was secretary for three of, of those years. So of course I had to run for president of Michigan Dental Association and I won that election. And um, I did two terms and at the end of the second term, it was Board of Trustees for the American Dental Association. And by this time, my wife had decided that, wait a minute, now wait, wait, wait. <laughs> I was managing the practice well though. Um, yeah, that's what I was gonna ask you. I, I right? really wanted to hear about right? how you balance this leadership role with mm -hmm. you know, work-life balance or even just your practice balance because I mean the ADA presidency is more than a full-time job. Yes. So I, I started to, when I got into private practice after I left uh, my children's health center, in my private practice, I took a lot of, of um, CE. And really, I learned not only through the uh, organizations, but with um, CE and on us in, in separate areas, such as the Chicago Midwinter, et, et cetera. And one of the best things I learned was how to cross train my staff. Mm -hmm. uh, just about every staff member could do practically anything in the office. And that really kept me flowing. I could manage my appointments because I had so many things that were just taken care of and I, I was properly prepared. So outlining the days that I would be in the office, we just managed to run that practice efficiently. And I did that through the presidency of the Michigan Dental Association. So when I won the elections for Chicago, that was a different story. Um, these, these board meetings were Oh, about every three months, but it was a lot more involved than just board meetings. For instance, uh, my first year, I was uh, assigned to, um, well, my first trip was to China. Mm -hmm. Zin, uh, uh, Shenzhen, China. Mm -hmm. And that was one of my, one of my uh, assignments. Uh, that and moving with the board meetings and uh, moving to some states in order to help to update the progress of uh, ADA to get everybody really in the frame of mind about what's going on in dentistry. I did that for, for four years also. And by the time the 40, fourth year was up, um, I did something that nobody had done for a while. <laughs> I, I ran for president-elect of the American Dental Association, and I ended up winning it. The last president from Michigan was in 1966, like the year that I graduated. And um, there, there was another Michigan graduate um, 30 or 40 years later that was now president of the American Dental Association. As president-elect, uh, things, my assignments were very similar, except you could just multiply them by about eight or nine. So the travel was, was really diverse. Uh, uh, it covered, oh, probably 40 of the states in the country. Mm -hmm. And I was still going to um, overseas for, for um, that committee assignment only I was going as president-elect. Um, it, it both, president-elect and president, are salaried positions. So I was working, I was an employee okay. as an officer of the American Dental Association. Uh, I had to have 
an associate. And um, sure, was, just to keep your practice going. Right, right, right. Yeah. Because uh, when when push came to shove, I had about uh, three days a month that I could spend in the practice. But my niece, my niece, uh, Dr. Tracy Dancer, was available, mm -hmm. and uh, she actually stepped right in, and things were well organized. So she did didn't have much to do as far as getting the practice organized. It was already set and the staff was ready to just bring her right in and do the same things that, that um, we had been doing for, for years. So she just really fit right in and uh, things flowed quite well, quite well. Well, that was, that was really helpful and timely. Yes, absolutely. How about, how about Jill? How patient was she with this? Jill traveled a lot with me. Oh, that's she, awesome. Mm -hmm. She went to China. She went to Brazil. Um, there were about at least 10 countries that, that we visited. And I was invited back to Brazil two more times. But she said that, that you can go by yourself. <laughs> <laughs> you can go. But um, it, was, it was really beneficial for her because uh, neither one of us had traveled this much outside of the United States. So you know, as happy as she was that I was elected, she was really uh, involved and, and appreciated uh, exactly having an opportunity to, to travel with me and to see exactly what was going on in dentistry also. And how old was your daughter then? My daughter, uh, Holly was I mean, was she, did she travel with you or was she old enough to be on her own? She, she was old enough to be on her own at okay. that time. Right, okay. right. I was, I was trying to remember put, put, and, and put those, those months together. She graduated from, from high school in 1985. Okay. And um, of course I was elected, uh, 88 president elect in 2009. Yeah. So yeah, she yeah. had. Yeah. Grown up. Yeah, we had done a lot of things together. And uh, so, yeah. so one of the things that um, is quite memorable during your presidency was that you had the opportunity to highlight and seek resolution for discriminatory membership practices that the ADA had experienced. Yes. I wonder if you would tell us a little bit about the history of that and, and just your experience about that, that really important letter. The, the problem was the bylaws of the American Dental Association. And um, really, I believe that as time passed, it wasn't really noticed that much by the, the new trustees and by the, the, the new people, um, executive director, everybody that, that were uh, coming in to work for the ADA. But it did not have exclusionary policies. It did not, um, it did not say that minorities were not acceptable or uh, do not accept into membership any minorities but it didn't say anything different. It did not um, deny states or, or um, associations the ability to do so. And uh, there were many states, mainly Southern states sure. that were engaged in this practice. Um, there were many, many uh, African-American members um, and other minority members to some, some female that were being denied membership. And it was um, um, 19, really it was 1966, the year that I graduated, that the policy, the, the bylaws were actually updated in order to basically state that membership cannot be, not, cannot be denied mm -hmm. on the basis of race, creed, color, and of course, things have been added then. Um, you know, it, it's it age discrimination it, it, and gender, mm -hmm. and right. And so it 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 is a moving target. But having done that, 
then things started to change. Uh, the membership increased, but um, the National Dental Association had already gotten just a significant number of uh, minority dentists, uh, primarily African-American. So although the apology for those previous actions came from me, and I thought it was interesting that as a member of the National Dental Association and an African-American, the first African-American to be elected president of the American Dental Association, that that letter had to come from me, yeah. but <laughs> but it did, and it did have an Well, impact. it could have come from somebody before, but thank goodness it did come from you. <laughs> right, right. But things have things have improved. There's a lot more work to be done though, as far as far as um, really uh, well, you know, diversity and inclusion are mm -hmm. concerned. But um, but um, well, as also as you know, by being um, in charge of the dental school, that things are really improving as far as diversity and inclusion. So uh, it's promising. It's promising, but really it, it could be speedier as far as I'm concerned because it's so, taken a very long time. Exactly. It's taken far too long and we still have a lot of work to do. Yes, but yeah. it's on the move. Yeah. Okay. So you have won a lot of different awards. We've already talked about some of them, uh, you know, fellowship in the ICD and ACD. Um, you receive the University of Michigan Distinguished Alumni Service Award. You serve the, the university as a whole on as a director on the alumni board. You were on the board of directors of Delta Dental. I'm curious from your perspective now, through all those roles and, and, and your perspective over the years, what do you think the leadership challenges are right now in our profession? I think the challenges are really difficult. Um, now, as far as new graduates go, and I would love to see them get into leadership positions, but to, they have to take a step by step and not really do it the way that I did it because I just took one step to the next, to the next. And it was a lot simpler then because I didn't have $300,000 in uh, worth of debt to repay. And I did, I really, I had one daughter. So, and plenty of time for she and my wife. So I had time for, to do things with the family. We traveled a lot and, and we did things together. I don't think those opportunities are available right now for new graduates. And I, I really think that the biggest barrier is finances um, the, the need to find a way to become established, to um, get the help they need in order to get those loans paid off and uh, find a way to, to be comfortable with the lifestyle. And I think doing it in, in, in bits and pieces, uh, committee, committee meetings and this type of thing, while they are, are uh, working an established practice or, or whatever venue that um, they find that uh, they would like to work in and get the finances under control and uh, practice under control, whichever type that might be. And then they can find the freedom to, um, to get into leadership positions because I, I, I can almost guarantee that once you get into a good solid leadership position, find out how influential that you can be with practically everyone, not only mentees and, and um, your affiliates, uh, uh, the other dentists that are, are friends and in other states and, and across the nation and actually around the globe, that um, it's, it's addicting. So what I don't want to see a new dentist or a new graduate or some that have been in practice for a short time get overwhelmed with it 
and uh, start spending time that they need to do other things with their lives just in order to, to be stable. Mm -hmm. But uh, after, you know, after getting firmly established, and I really, I, I, I think to pursue a leadership position, which would be just incredible, just fascinating, especially my mentees. You bring up, I mean, the point of uh, debt and the financial burdens is, is really significant now, as we know. Um, I have to say that we have spent a lot of effort on this in um, identifying support for our students. Um, our alumni have been very generous. The university has been supportive in this. And, and although I would say that our students still graduate with far too much debt, um, the figures that I've seen recently are Michigan graduates are graduating over a hundred thousand dollars less oh, than the average national debt. Fantastic! That's yeah. that's awesome. Yeah, I, and I would love to, you know, say at some point that we had support to cover all the tuition, but we we'll keep working. We'll keep working on that. Oh yes, and I had um an interview by um, the International College of Dentistry. I'm getting another award from them at the um, oh. <laughs> oh, meeting in October. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And, and we talked about that. Um, I was asked what I thought one of the biggest areas of concern was in dentistry. And I told them that uh, I was concerned about faculty recruitment and the, the need for faculty. And I also, I, I, um, I compared this with, uh, or, or actually I blamed it on the ability of uh, graduates to continue, not only in a position of faculty, but to continue in research. And I know you've got some graduates coming up that um, are going to, to have two degrees when they, when they graduate. And it would be fantastic just to see more of them because without the research, um, we couldn't move forward like we're moving forward. And uh, we couldn't really educate like our young students are being educated right now and in a facility like uh, or a dental school like University of Michigan. Yeah. Yeah, you know, when you said, you talked earlier about uh, taking on leadership roles because you realized that people listen and would listen to you um, just, you know, clearly states how people want to have an impact. And, and it was clear that you could have that impact because people were listening. And I would say it's very similar uh, as recruiting faculty because, you know, we get faculty who want to make an impact in students' lives. And, and when they feel that, it's a, an incredibly rewarding yes. uh, part of their profession. Yes, so, absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, part of these interviews is around a leadership elective that um, I have with our dental students. And I'm just curious if you have any other advice for students who may be interested in pursuing leadership roles in our profession. No, I really part, part of, of my um, initiative was to demonstrate that I could be an effective leader. And I wanted to, I wanted my mentees to see just how effective I was and to know how effective they can be. And um, I'd, I'd really enjoyed, after seeing some of, the, of my mentees and some of the students that, that are attending the dental school, I can sense the talent and the expertise that, that these students have. And that potential you know, is, is just endless. I would really like to see them get in positions so they can pursue some, some leadership uh, 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 possibilities or probabilities because we need them. We, the dentistry needs them that need that type of leadership in order to just to demonstrate that we 
are the experts in our profession. And that any questions from uh, policymakers, general public, outside stakeholders, anybody that needs to know anything as far as dentistry is concerned should come to us just to find out what's what. And I, I just, um, I, I've been promoting that just as often as, as possible. I still have a lot of mentees. I've got, uh, I've got one that shadows us right now that, that is, nice. yeah, he's looking to get into dental school. Um, and he probably will apply for the uh, Profile for Success program. Right. Great. So, well, it's going on right now for this year. So would that um, be next year's so, program? Yeah, he, he should apply for next year's program. Okay. And that won't be a problem with him. I think he's got another year to get himself we've together. And we've been running it virtually this year, except we're going to have actually a three day in person part of it. So we're, we're getting, getting back to normal. Yeah. Fantastic. Is there anything else that you would like to add? Well, I just wanted to thank you for giving me this opportunity to, to really have this chat because uh, we've just been going back and forth about uh, what's going on with dentistry, what's going on with me, what's going on with you, and, um, and where we are with the dental school as far as the progress that, that we're making as far as um, really upgrading and rebuilding. Um, and I know more and more about that because I'm, I'm on the board of the uh, Delta Foundation also, mm -hmm. so both the corporation and the foundation. And so I'm just uh, with them, keeping an eye on everything and just seeing how beneficial that uh, we can be as, as a foundation and how beneficial I can be as a, as a practice, practicing dentist. I did get slowed down uh, for two reasons. COVID was primary because that kept me from coming back to the office for a couple of months, except for emergencies. But, but before then, um, I, I have a, a heart murmur that I've had for a lifetime. And uh, on one of my routine exams, I work out continuously. Uh, one, one of my routine exams, the murmur was louder than, than a primary care physician thought it should be. So he sent me to a cardiologist and um, he was listening and he almost jumped when he heard it. So I had a heart catheter done and was told that um, it was mitral valve prolapse and that it, yeah, it, it was, um, blood was leaking into my, into my lungs. So I had the surgery, um, no replacement but a repair. They put a ring on it. And um, I don't know, the surgery probably lasted about maybe two hours, but I've had to stay in intensive care for, gosh, it must've been a, a good solid week. It felt longer, but um, healing from that took time. I could not get back to the practice for a month. And Dr. Dansler had left. She's not working for Delta. Mm. So during that healing time, and then uh, finally getting back to the office after I was allowed, it was a short time later that the office was closed because of COVID and the state mandate. And that lasted for two months. We could only do emergency procedures. So the numbers of patients waiting and with emergencies, it just multiplied. And I'm, I'm really still, catching up with them. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of stress-related bruxism, a lot of broken teeth, just uh, just uh, problems. But You look great. So <laughs> I hope you're back to being able to exercise and take care of yourself. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I'm back to my normal exercise um, activities. The only thing that slows me down now is that number of patients that I'm seeing. Yeah. <laughs> so by the time I get home, I'm so tired. I, <laughs> I really okay. just got to crash. You need another associate. Right, right. I'm looking, but it's got to be the right one. Yeah. I had a patient that thanked me for not retiring. So <laughs> I said, you're welcome. I didn't tell him there's no guarantees now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I'm sure. Bill, and I, Bill Cottowitz and I came on board at the same time. And uh, he's- Well, you were in the same dental class. Yes, yes. 
Uh, we both went and you were both from the same town. Did you know you did you know Bill before you went to dental school? No, no, I didn't no. know him until I until I was there. Okay. And uh, actually, he went through the same process. He went to undergrad for, for two years also. Mm -hmm. And uh, Bill and I were, and one other were the youngest in the class. So, and he's retired. Yeah. So he let me know about that. And I'm thinking, yeah. hmm, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm enjoying it. I really am. Well, it, you do what you enjoy. He's doing what he enjoys. He's keeping pretty active and engaged. Right. Right. That's great. But. I so appreciate, Ray, all you've done to support the school. I know every time, you know, we call you to participate in an event, you, you've, been, uh, you've been here, you've served the university through many different ways and obviously served our profession in a really profound way. Uh, just thank you so much for your professional service and thank you for being a great friend as well. Oh, thank you. I appreciate it. You're very welcome. And I look forward to actually continue what I've been doing with, with everything that you that you just mentioned. And uh, thank you for the conversation today. Oh, yes. I appreciate the interview, too. Thanks for inviting me. OK, take care.